okay. Okay, hello. Um, yeah, well, I'm here every night at 9 p.m. So uh, welcome, everyone. If you have to go, that's fine, but uh, you're welcome to come back any night. Or every night except Monday. I think there's something else scheduled on Monday, and I'm busy Monday anyway, so it works out well. So I'm guessing some of this crowd is from the last session. If you have to get up and go, that's fine. But you're welcome to stay. Alright, is my volume okay? Am, am I too low? Delani says I'm too too quiet. Mm, how do I fix that? Test, test. Is that better? Is that better? Louder now. All right, welcome everyone. And to my local audience, one meditator. You know, it's really for them that I'm doing this. We have people here who... Uh, who come and stay in our center and dedicate days, weeks, sometimes even months to intensive practice, 8, 10, 12, even more hours a day sometimes. They're the real MVPs. They're the, uh, the core of Buddhism. They've come to dedicate their their lives for this period of time, the whole of their self, the whole of their being, to the meditation practice. And so it behooves me to try my best to talk about things useful for them, not just for the internet. We can do that after after I can answer questions as usual. But well, for everyone, obviously the most important thing is meditation, right? This is what we focus on in Buddhism. This is what makes Buddhism Buddhism. And so it's somewhat um, important. This is why it's important to talk about religion and get an understanding of what it means, because otherwise you end up with religions as things, and you end up equating them. You have this, I think it's called essentialist, essentialism, saying all religions are the same. Which is such a disappointing sort of point of view from uh, from a Buddhist point of view because because of how different it is and then people think that Buddhism is just about worshipping a god, a Buddha and hey you're worshipping the wrong god you should be worshipping our god and in fact that's not at all what we're doing So we practice meditation. Let's recap what meditation we're practicing. Well, here at our center, we're practicing in insight meditation. Insight meditation based on the four foundations of mindfulness, to be exact. 
So the four foundations of mindfulness, these are things we have to know to start the practice. We have to remember these four and use them as our basic tools. This is our tool set. It doesn't change throughout the course. There will never come a time during the course where I ask you to deviate from these four. There will never be a time where you should practice something else as your main practice. Now from time to time you might want to switch to metta meditation. Take a few minutes, not a few hours, not even many minutes, but a few minutes to send love to those people you love, those people you hate, trying to gain a sense of equanimity or equilibrium, to let go of your attachments and your aversions, to let go of animo animosity, animosity, enmity, free yourself for the and to prepare yourself and to support your practice of insight meditation but by far most of our attention most of our time should be focused on insight meditation and the four foundations of mindfulness so the four foundations of mindfulness is the meditation the body kaya kaya nupasi viharati we dwell contemplating the body and the body this is the first foundation body and the body means we can focus on walking when we're walking <coughs> keep your mind with the movement of the feet focus on the stomach when you're sitting Watching the stomach rise and fall, the body's reaction to the breath. Or you can note sitting, you can note standing, you can note lying. You can note the movements of the body, you can note chewing and swallowing and drinking. Urinating and defecating, you can note brushing your teeth. Washing your body in the shower, you can note all of these things. Number two, Vedana, Vedana, Suvedana, Nupasi, Viharati, feelings. So if you feel pain, you note pain, pain. Then you're practicing mindfulness of the feelings. When you feel happy, you say happy, happy. When you feel calm, you say calm, calm. Mind, Jitte, Jitta, Nupasi, Viharati. Noting the mind in the mind. You note thinking, thinking. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, past thoughts, future thoughts. It's all just thinking. Dhamme sudhamma nupasi viharati. You dwell. Number four with the dhammas. So dhammas is a somewhat difficult term to translate. But we've got groups of teachings of the Buddha. First the five hindrances. You know, liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, doubt when they arise. And then the senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking, and so on. We note in this way, we remind ourselves. The word sati means to rem remember or to remind yourself. Not about the past, but about the present. It's this shift that goes on when you move from conceptual reality to ultimate reality, from thinking about people, places, things, to an awareness of now, the awareness of the senses, the awareness of experience, of seeing and hearing and so on. And so by reminding yourself in this way, it keeps you focused on reality but not reacting to reality it keeps you at a perfect distance so that you just see seeing as seeing hearing as hearing it doesn't let you get too close so that you start to react and judge the object but it keeps you the perfect distance from the object so that you feel you experience it just as it is 
with no liking, disliking, no me, mine, no attaching or identifying with it. Vinaya Lokeya Bija Domanasang. You give up attachment and aversion. And then you apply, so to do that you apply Atapi Sampajano Satima, you apply uh, effort, mindfulness and wisdom. What I wanted to talk today actually was about these uh, the, the four um, the four basic qualities that are required or the four principles of insight meditation. These are four things that my teacher would often teach. He'd say these are the four things that you need in the practice of mindfulness. So the first one is that you need to be in the present moment And this I've already touched on This is that shift where you shift from past and future and concepts To here and now It means not obsessing over the past or the future Even in terms of your practice Realizing that you haven't been mindful well, Don't obsess over that, focus on now being mindful Worrying about the future Thinking about the future When you're going to be mindful When you're going to meditate Feeling guilty that you haven't meditated And so on And, fi and switching and focusing on now And meditating now It means noting things as they happen Keeping up with the experiences, being flexible, not getting waylaid by an experience. Experiences are, are to be experienced, not to be clung to. Something arises and we cling to it and so we get lost in the past as it disappears. We can't let it go and so we start to think about it, worry about it. We obsess over it, even though it's gone. We begin to think about the future, when things are going to come, worrying or anticipating, expecting, hoping. And the Buddha said, Adita nanwa kameya napatikang ke anagatang. One shouldn't go back to the past nor worry about the future. Yadatitang pehinantang apatancha anagatang. What's in the past is gone, what's in the future has not yet come. Pachupanancha yo dhammang tata tata vipasati. One sees, if one acts in these ways, if one, if one lets go of the past and lets go of the future, one will see what's in the present clearly. Vipasati. So this is how it leads to vipassana. When you give up the past and the future You finally start to see what's real You see how the mind works And so it's important to Recognize that we're not concerned about What caused the mind to be this way in the past Because all of that is conjecture at this point It's only memories and memories are and Memories are based on On Thought, not observation. And so, if you want to know what is the cause, what is the effect, you see it here and now. You see it by watching things as they happen, watching our experiences as they happen. That's the first one And the second one is continuity Meditation has to become part of our lives Has to be something we do throughout our day Throughout our lives 
not something you can put down for months and expect to retain the, the, what you've gained meditation is a habit something you have to build this is why coming to the meditation center is such a great and noble act because it allows you to devote the whole of your being and to immerse the whole of your being every every aspect of your waking life every habit inclination every predilection every part of who you are is exposed to this change and so you should, it's it's not a burden it's an opportunity to perform ordinary activities and learn how in a protected environment meditation center is very protected you don't have any of the stresses or conflicts or challenges of ordinary life and so when you eat you can do it mindfully when you shower you can do it mindfully this also means that the amount of time you spend meditating is somewhat irrelevant meditation is not by time it's by moment so continuity means that you have to repeat it has to become habitual you can't find the magic switch and turn off all your suffering you have to retrain your mind and you have to see clearly so that the retraining is done naturally so that you're not cultivating new bad habits or new artificial habits where you suppress the problems you cultivate natural habits of seeing things as they actually are not as you believe them to be or as I believe them to be but as you experience them, as they truly are. So continuity means moment after moment after moment. The third one is in regards to actually practicing, uh, ac actually cultivating mindfulness. So we talk about focusing on the moments, and then the question is, what do we do with those moments? And so that's, that's as I mentioned, the cultivation of atapi sampajano satima. It means we need a quality of mind that is pure, quality of mind that is clear. only for a moment but you need that moment and so it's a skill that you have to learn how to somewhat elusive at first as the meditator tries to force the state and is walking somewhat blind right we have we tell them to repeat to themselves we don't give them much more ex instruction or explanation but it's sort of purposeful because we're not trying to create an artificial state we're trying to give up all of the artifice. Seeing should really just be seeing. There's nothing special. In that, in its, in in essence, the, the the perfect moment is just lacking everything else. It's lacking everything that would make it imperfect. It's a very difficult thing to attain, but it's, a, it's also quite simple. There should be no feeling to it or quality other than clarity, purity. When you say to yourself, seeing, and that, that is a recognition, when you feel the recognition that yes, that's what it was. It's not, not associated with judgment or, or identification. 
we're associated with wisdom and understanding, the seeing that that is that is what it is. This is seeing. This is the perfect moment. Uh, the opiate has effort. The effort doesn't mean you force your mind onto the object. It just means you don't get lazy and let your mind wander. You don't give in to the defilement. The boredom, for example. Meditation can be quite boring. And as I say often now, um, there's the only difference between boredom and peace is your own Your own, uh, your own mind, your own outlook. So for some people, meditation is terribly boring, which says more about them than about meditation, because meditation is quite peaceful. But they think walking back and forth for hours and hours, sitting still for hours and hours, I could be doing other things. They'd rather be doing other things. Most of us would. We're so attached and addicted to so many different things that the last thing we want to do is sit still and do nothing. There's so much to do. And so atapi just means staying the course. And continuing, not giving in to defilements or distractions. Sampajano means to see things as they are, to know seeing as seeing, hearing as hearing, to know it for what it is. And that is, goes together with effort. I mean, these aren't separate things that you, you turn on one by one, they come together. That's what the effort is. It's the effort to know this is seeing, this is hearing, and so on. And satima, satima is the, the noting. Satima is once you know that this is seeing, you say to yourself, seeing. And the key to this is the, the kind of like a mantra. The key is that this replaces our ordinary habits, our ordinary reactions. This is the training of the mind. Saying to your mind, no, 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 that's not bad, that's not good, that's not me, that's not mine. That's seeing, we're reminding ourselves. That's what sati means, that's what the word actually means. Cultivating this recognition or, or remembrance of things as they are so that you don't lose sight of it you don't forget that well that's that's actually just seeing or that's actually just pain you don't forget that and get caught up in why you dislike the pain and how it afflicts you and so on so number three is you have to do it right you have to actually meditate you have to actually be mindful Number four is you have to balance your faculties. It's sort of related to the last one, but it means you can't get caught up in one or the other of the faculties. Don't get caught up in confidence. Don't get too cocky or too confident. I mean, don't don't just fixate on just that. Don't get fixed on effort, so you start to push harder and harder. That will ruin your practice as well. Don't get hung up on concentration, trying to focus on a single object. That will mess up your practice. And don't get hung up on wisdom, doubting or trying to understand everything all at once. Trying to understand is not really a good way to go about understanding. Understanding comes from seeing. And seeing comes from looking. Looking is the... Uh, is this practice of mindfulness, creating a clear vision of what things actually are. 
and you have too much confidence, you start to get greedy, or, or you know, you, you follow after your heart's desire or your heart's impulse. You follow your heart. This is this Western concept that is not at all amusing to us Buddhists. We frown on following your heart. Not a good idea. Purify your heart first. If your if your heart is pure, then by all means follow it. But don't just follow it because it's your heart. Your heart can be corrupt. Can lead you astray. Can lead you into suffering. If you have too much effort, if you focus too much on it, you'll just get agitated. You'll become restless. If you focus on concentration, you'll become uh, stiff. The mind will become stiff, uh, rigid, unwieldy, unmalleable, unflexible. The mind won't be able to keep up with reality. So it'll get stuck on one thing and it'll lose sight of what's really going on. You might enter into very nice meditative states, but you won't ever come to see things clearly. You won't ever come to understand reality because you're not keeping up. So don't, don't fixate too much on concentration. And uh, if you have too much wisdom, or if you focus too much on wisdom, above all other faculties, then you'll just get, you'll cultivate doubt. You'll start to wonder and, and become confused, unsure, trying to understand everything, analyzing everything, wondering which is the right way to go because you're not actually looking at reality, right? Real wisdom has to come from mindfulness. All of these things, they come naturally as an outpouring of the practice of mindfulness. So you have to watch these five, five, four good things. Confidence, effort, concentration, wisdom. Four good things that you have to be careful. You have to take care with that they don't become your focus. Your focus should be mindfulness and these other four will come through mindfulness. So that's the basic those are the basic fundamentals of, of practice. I mean, many of you have heard them, and I think anyone who's read my booklet, they're in there, but that doesn't matter. We just spent a half an hour focused on them. This is how Dhamma talks go. You can repeat the same teaching again and again because it's like chanting, only better. Instead of having to focus on the words, you can focus on the, con the ideas, the concepts the teachings, and you can put them into practice. Delaney, you're in front of my camera. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. So that's the Dhamma for tonight. Have a good night. Um, yes, so any questions I'm happy to answer. You are actually. You just walked right in front of my, my camera. That is Delaney, right? I'm recording this. And you're standing in front of right where I'm recording it from. We use the words heart and mind interchangeably. I don't have a... I mean, I'm, I'm, when I say heart, I'm usually referring to the mind and not the... Uh, not the organ. Hadaya. Hadaya. That can also be physical, but yeah. No, in I mean in English we do use the word heart to mean mind. It's difficult because in English we tend to think of the mind as intellectual and the heart as emotional, but in Buddhism there's not really that distinction. So if anyone has questions or if you have other comments, I'm happy to field field them for the next little while.
You're welcome to get up and go if you like, or you can just sit here and meditate together as the sun goes down in our artificial world. I don't think you're welcome, Delaney. Thank you for for having this place. You do a great service keeping this alive all these years. You and Zeno. I haven't seen Zeno in a while. No, it was okay. It was just kind of funny. Suddenly your head pops up right in front of the camera. I could still see it. Is Zeno not, in, not around these days? I see him sometimes on Facebook, I think, with his son. Anyway, thank you for having me. If there are no questions, you're welcome to ask questions about Buddhism, meditation in general. If there are none, I'm just going to head off. At some point, uh, we should probably connect this with uh, the meditation, our meditation community, and post those questions here. But uh, I can't do it because I'm recording my screen. So if I were to switch back and forth, it would be kind of jarring, I think. Well, it's great to be here. Yeah, well, if you like, why don't why not? Let's post some of those questions. If there's a question queue, that. All right, four different paths to nibbana. Two main ones, including vipassana yanika and samatha yanika. Is either one better for some people? Like in some cases, that vipassana yanika may not be working for me, and that I have to switch to samatha yanika. Also, for vipassana yanika, do I lack? Do a lack of concentration Okay, it just disappeared A lack of concentration and hindrances Forbear one from culminating insight hmm. You know, I mean, the, the goal is Nibbana To attain Nibbana you have to practice insight meditation to some extent you have to gain samatha as well, but it's up to you whether you want to do it first or or do it together with the vipassana. And so to some extent it's kind of like asking what's better, becoming a Buddha or becoming an Arahant. It's not quite like that. Some people will become Buddhas, some people will become Arahant. If you're wondering what's important for you, well, you have to understand the facts and figure out what, what your path is going to be. Um, for many people, samatha meditation is not a very good option because they don't have the time and the energy to focus on all the times, all the, all the time that it requires to to cultivate the uh, the jhanas and magical powers and so on. And so given that an in-depth practice of samatha is not necessary, some people will forego it. Our tradition tends to forego it. Samatha meditation is like a, like fancy bottles. My teacher once gave this simile of medicine. Medicine can be in a fancy bottle or it can be in an ordinary bottle. 
But if you put it in the ordinary bottle, it's still medicine. Samatha is just fancy bottles. That's not quite, I mean, it's, it's one way of looking at it. But what he's saying is that even medicine can even be for poor people who don't have the money to pay for the good bottle. And so, um, I mean, samatha is, is 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 useful. It's helpful for vipassana. It's just the question is how long it's going to take you and the effort that you're going to use. Um, it's probably going to take you longer and require more effort to do the complete practice with practicing all the jhanas and so on. So I'm not really going to answer that question directly as it was asked, but just give you some background. There's not really a better or worse answer there. They're just different. Um, as far as like for some people or others, there really isn't a, that it really isn't the case that some people would be better at samatha, some people would be better at vipassana. It's not really like that. Some people would be more inclined to one or the other. But uh, it's not like some people should practice samatha and some people shouldn't. It's just how much, because everyone, the mind works the same for everyone. It, you can tr cultivate tranquility or you can cultivate insight, no matter who you are. I mean, if you're not able to do one, you won't be able to do the other. Some people you know, whose, whose minds are not well equipped to cultivate meditations people who have me severe mental illness or people who are have down syndromes or down syndrome or something like that probably quite difficult to do either what have you found has been a particularly useful practice for avoiding wrong speech Association with good people is always a good one for most questions like this. Uh, mindfulness, of course. I mean, the thing about these kinds of speech is that they're associated with negative mind states. So the best solution is to f free yourself from wholesome, mi from unwholesome mind states. It's really the only answer. Anything else is artificial. It's just a forcing and a, you know a uh, contrived. Morality. Harsh speech is only done away with at anagami. Uh, lying is done away at, with at sotapanna. So, lying is is the big one. It's the one the Buddha focused the most attention on, realizing that the other one's quite a bit more difficult. Um, but lying is something you can take as a rule. It's a good rule to have. Don't lie. Not explicitly, anyway. The orthodox uh, doctrine is that a sotapanna can't lie. Now, people might contest that. You're welcome to. But that is the orthodox doctrine of the tradition I follow. Yeah, I'm not really into giving giving um, recommendations for places. There's too much involved, and it's not. This isn't really the place for that. Or maybe I just get too much of that. Like I'm always getting questions about where should I go. 
it's hard to do because I, I don't really, I'm not there. I'm, I, I think I'm inclined just to say, well, you know, I, I'm offering courses in Canada if you ever want to come here. And I know that's probably not the answer for most people, but it's it's my answer. You know, I do what I do and that's it. And if that helps you, great. If it doesn't help you, I'm sorry, but you can always find other places. Oh, something big here. If all defilements or impurities stem from the three poisons, wouldn't the hindrances be merely specifications or subdivisions, and so wouldn't be restlessness and remorse? The fourth hindrance be technically aversion or hatred, the second of the three poisons. If restlessness and remorse technically fall into the hatred poison, wouldn't Meta consider the antidote for counter and will be effective for restlessness and remorse? Um, right, so it's not remorse. Uh, exactly, that's not a very good translation. Kukucha is worry. It's um, a sense of agitation. Uh, it's almost remorse because it's based on something, usually something you've done in the past. Um, but it's worry, and so it's actually a delusion mind state. It's not anger. But yes, you're you're right, all of these have to do with the three kilesa. And so if you study Abhidhamma, you can find out where they all uh, rest. So Kama Chanda is, of course, in the Loba Mula Jitta, it's with Loba. Um, Vayapada is, of course, Dosa, Dosa Mula Jitta, anger-based. Uh, Tina Midha is a delusion mind. Tina Midha, hmm, maybe it's not. I'll look into that. That might be a how that I can't remember how that one relates to, but it's in there. It's so those are jeta sikas and can't remember which minds they go with. I mean, it's definitely, if anything, on the delusion side. But uh, udacha and kukucha. Again, I'm, I can't remember about udacha, but kukucha is definitely one of the one of the delusion minds. And the other delusion mind is uh, Kicha, which is the last one, doubt. So uh, the Abhidhamma has you covered. If you want to learn about which the, what they are, you study the Abhidhamma and you'll get a, a sense of uh, where they all rest. But th what you're calling remorse, is that, that in the five hindrances, is actually one of the delusion minds. So it's not yet an, an anger or a self-hatred or so on. Or sadness, even. I try to avoid timing my meditation. Meditate when I want to. Yeah, it cultivates egotism and aversion. Thus I meditate. So I want my practice to progress in terms of being able to meditate longer. You have stated not to worry about the length of t or time. Thus should I or shouldn't I place focus on ensuring I'm meditating for longer periods over time and remain casual? Right, well, remember, meditation, insight meditation is about challenging you. It's not meant to be easy. So when you say it cultivates aversion and egotism, well, it doesn't actually. It's just an action. What it does is it challenges you because uh, you, you want to stop and yet you don't stop. You, know? you don't do what you want and so you challenge yourself. Sitting still, there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't... Uh, Um, it doesn't in and of itself give rise to defilements it's just that be because of your tendency to react to things you get upset about it so in that sense it's actually good to force yourself to to do a specific length of time not do more because you want to do more but not do less because you want to do less the artificial nature of timing things it uh, challenges you. The other reason for timing is so that because we also do walking meditation and it's easy to prefer one or the other and that's an important challenge as well.
to learn to let go of your likes and dislikes by doing exactly the same amount of time walking or sitting. Now for advanced, advanced meditators who have just completed the course, it's probably the only time right after they've finished a, an intensive meditation course, we, we throw this rule out and we say, walk as much as you want to walk, sit as much as you want to sit, because they're at the peak of the practice for those few days af that if they hang out after they've done finished the course. They've been practicing intensive meditation for days and days. And you can trust them to, to know wh what's the proper amount. But until you get there, 99% of the time you're quitting, well, 90% of the time you're quitting because uh, because of some defilement. So you're encouraging, you're in, in reinforcing the habit of aversion, the habit of um, attachment, likes and dislikes, by quitting when you want to. I want to sit a little bit longer because it's pleasant. Well, that's desire or, or liking, attachment. I want to stop because it's not comfortable. Well, that's cultivating aversion. They're, these are habits, and you reinforce them, and you reinforce your likes and dislikes, and that is a recipe for suffering. Does the meditation center require submission? You mean my meditation center? I think, oh, these are from are these from the other website? Um, I don't understand what is meant by submission. If you mean do you have to submit a form? Yes, you have to submit a form. If you mean submitting to me, like submitting your soul, or like what I talked about last night. Um, as I said, we've stopped doing, I'm not doing the opening ceremony here in Canada. That's one of the reasons, is because people are scared of religion. Unfortunately, as I talked about last night, I think that video has already gotten, that video is funny, I got already got comments from a Jesus person something like come back to Jesus brother like really I mean it's, it's so funny like take your God and go home it's like if someone came on and said uh, come back to Thor brother or it's like wh wh why would I why would I choose your little book about some guy who Claim to be the son of God. I mean, there's there's lots of books like that. Why would you even think that I would choose? What would give me a reason to choose your God over somebody else's God? I mean, what would give me the reason to choose a God anyway? What would be the benefit of that? And there was another person who was just awful about it, but I don't think it went over so well. <laughs> I think it was disconcerting for people that to have find me suddenly talking about religious religiosity it's meant to be uncomfortable it was a, i think it's an important challenge the challenge to com commit yourself and to submit yourself to something to plunge head headlong in and so the answer is no we don't require that but it isn't it is if you can do it because if you find the, the, the key is if you find something that is actually pure and good then absolutely you should cast off all doubt dedicate yourself wholeheartedly to it and that's the the problem is finding that thing that is pure and perfect not the not the actual religiosity so religion is not bad in in inherently submission is not bad so if that's what is meant if it's that kind of submission then we don't require it but some to some extent it's useful i mean it's useful and if you can do it to some extent that would be to your benefit I've heard that if someone has a determination to become a Buddha instead of an Arahant, he will not attain Magapala, even if he does Vipassana meditation. Be, yeah, because be, to be a Buddha is to, to put aside your enlightenment. You made a determination not to become enlightened. That's what being a Buddha is. So, yeah, so that, that, would, that does very clearly get in a person's way, prevent them until they give it up unless they give up that vow uh, they won't attain Magapala because that's the power of their determination
oh, so how would I explain it? Well, it's you know, it's the power of the mind. The mind has this. We make certain determinations during the course, and and those are actually to attain nibbana. And there's a power to that. You know how strong the power is depends on the strength. If you just casually say, "I want to become a Buddha," it's probably not going to get very much in your way. But if you determine and if you set your mind on that, then you're, you're, you're fixing your mind in samsara in the future. It seems the mind always seeks happiness, so I try and find wholesome activities or refuges for happiness. can only meditate for so long. I don't do the comments thing. You have to ask a particular question. Maybe I do. I don't know. Um, I don't have any comments. I think yeah. I think do me a favor, please, and and ask me what you want to know. Where do you look for happiness? Well, don't look for happiness. Happiness should not be the your focus. Your focus should be goodness because happiness doesn't lead to happiness. If your focus is on happiness, you will not be happy. Why? Because you're not cultivating that which leads to happiness. Look for goodness. Seek out goodness like a starving person seeking out food like a person with their head on fire seeking out water. Seek out goodness in everything you do. Forget about happiness. Completely forget about happiness. Totally and completely. Focus solely on goodness and you'll always be happy. So where should you seek out happiness? In goodness. But... In fact, you shouldn't ever seek out happiness because it's that's an addiction, it's an attachment, it's it's not conducive to happiness. We seek out happiness because we are unsatisfied and dissatisfaction is, is a defilement and it's a form of anger, it's a disliking. You're angry at your situation, you dislike your situation. Not a good thing, not goodness. All right, I'm going to go. That's all for tonight. Thank you all for coming out. Tomorrow I'm off. Uh, no, tomorrow I should be here, but Monday I'm I am not here. So, should see you all tomorrow. Have a good night. <coughs>